not all sacrifices are created equal. Neither are all sins created equal. And we must remember that not all sacrificial offerings are for sin. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up. My name's Elijah Weiss. That's my grandfather, Randy Weiss. And this is Crosstalk, but I think you need a little more context. Follow me. So if you couldn't tell by the last names, this is a family ministry. My grandfather's been doing this for over 50 years, and I get the privilege of helping out. We are Jewish believers in the Jewish Messiah. And listen, I know how that sounds, but trust me, the more you watch these videos, the more you'll understand. The video you just clicked on is about sacrifice. It talks about the ancient Jewish traditions and what sacrifice looked like then, and what it looks like now, and why Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. Stick around, hit that subscribe button, we're gonna need it and you're gonna enjoy it, trust me. Not all uncleanness would be considered a sin. For example, a woman's menstrual cycle would render her ritually impure. Yet no one should suggest that a woman had sinned simply because of her natural biological monthly cycle. Similarly, childbirth is a blessing from God. Nevertheless, giving birth renders a woman ritually unclean. And Moses instructed us about the various sacrifices that were ordered by God specifically just for such occasions. He said, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman be delivered and bear a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of the impurity of her sickness shall she be unclean. And she shall continue in the blood of purification three and thirty days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification be fulfilled. But if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her impurity, and she shall continue in the blood of purification threescore and six days. And when the days of her purification are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tent of meeting unto the priest. And he shall offer it before the Lord, and she shall be cleansed from the fountain of her blood. This is the law for her that bears whether a male or a female. You can read about that in Leviticus chapter 12. Once again, this text reveals God's heart for the poor and proves His compassion to reduce the cost of being made ritually clean. It says, And if her means suffice not for a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean. Christian readers may recognize that when Joseph and Mary went to the temple after the time of her purification, she brought the offering of a poor person, two turtle doves. The New Testament says, Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. You see, Moses laid out God's plan for man's atonement in the most unmistakable terms in the very first chapter of Leviticus. Therein he explained the most basic requirements for a grotesque, yet spiritually and biblically effective burnt offering to be sacrificed by God's people for God to enact a well-pleasing outcome. Sin demands an atoning sacrifice. And I'm going to read it to you just like it's written. You need to know what atonement looked like to God and Moses. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall present the blood, and dash the blood round about against the altar that is at the door of the tent of meeting. And he shall flay the burnt offering, and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire upon the altar, and lay wood in order upon the fire. And Aaron's sons, the priests, 
shall lay the pieces and the head and the suet in order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar, but its inwards and its legs shall he wash with water and the priest shall make the whole smoke on the altar for a burnt offering, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. A more modern reading clarifies the intent of this bloody exercise and identifies the intended outcome of the ritual slaughter and the purpose of the animal's death in place of the death of a person who had sinned. It says it then becomes his substitute. The death of the animal will be accepted by God instead of the death of the man who brings it as the penalty for his sins. That's in the first chapter of Leviticus. Sin has a cost. The wages of sin is death. Forgiveness is available. Will God forgive us? Sure. But something or someone must die. As I've tried to show with graphic descriptions, forgiveness did not exist within biblical Judaism apart from the prescribed biblical sacrifices. God defined the details in the Mosaic law for ancient Jews so they could obtain forgiveness through the blood sacrifices that God demanded. Likewise, Christianity also came to recognize the biblical need of a sacrifice to atone for sins. Christians interpret the final sacrifice to have been accomplished through Jesus the Messiah. Modern Jews believe that the book of life is opened on Rosh Hashanah and our fate is sealed on Yom Kippur. If that fate is deemed by God to be for hardship and sorrow, Jews hope to change God's mind through fasting and praying. Many believe a simple appeal to God is sufficient to erase one's sins. Perhaps they assume that by refraining from food or drink, they have offered a sufficient sacrifice for their sins. That would be an epic failure, according to God's stated requirement of presenting a guilt offering or a sin offering. The Bible leaves no room for ignoring that an atonement is mandatory. It is widely acknowledged that God is merciful, patient, and willing to forgive. However, the Hebrew prophet reminds us that nobody with a guilty verdict against him will escape without punishment. The Bible says the Lord is slow to get angry, but his power is great and he never lets the guilty go unpunished. So, all of us should be desirous of having an atonement made on our behalf to remove our guilt. Another question, what does God say about sacrificial offerings for atonement? Well, the answer is precise. And this is the law of the guilt offering. It is most holy in the place where they kill the burnt offering. Shall they kill the guilt offering and the blood thereof shall be dashed against the altar round about. It is a guilt offering. As is the sin offering, so is the guilt offering. There's one law for them the priest that makes atonement therewith. But what is atonement? I mean, maybe a definition is required. One excellent reference suggests that atonement is the means by which the guilt punishment chain produced by violation of God's will is broken, as well as the resulting state of reconciliation at one mint with God. For most ancients, violation of the world order led to punishment by divine powers. Only atonement could prevent or end such punishment. The Hebrew Bible viewed a number of offerings and sacrifices as atoning. The best known were the elaborate sacrificial priestly rites of atonement developed mainly in the post-exilic period. The rites of atonement were carried out by the high priest through prescribed sacrifices in the temple. For early Judaism, the atonement base was broadened to include the sacrifice of martyrs whose achievements were calculated and deemed meritorious for others. Wait, Jews believe that martyrs could die to atone for the sins of other people? A Jewish martyr for sins? Seriously, 
One ancient Jewish work considered a special atonement through martyrdom during the intertestamental era, that time between the close of the Hebrew Bible and the revealing of the New Testament. Judaism had been enduring momentous religious and political upheaval. Christianity had not yet blossomed from the root of Judaism. The texts of that era are admittedly not canonical, yet the wisdom and faith-building testimonies contained in the ancient apocryphal and pseudepigraphical writings of pre-Christian Judaism are invaluable. One scholar concludes, it is not too much to say that no modern can intelligently understand the New Testament unless he is acquainted with the so-called Apocrypha and with the Pseudepigrapha as well. For the purposes of this discussion, consider a text from the century before Jesus that details the testimony of Eliezer the Jew. He was tortured to death by Antiochus Epiphanes during the Syrian persecution. Eliezer was commanded to eat the flesh of swine. He refused to break the Jewish law. At the threat of death, he chose martyrdom over compromise. The text of his moral battle holds one of the most inspiring tales of antiquity. The conclusion reached by the ancient Jewish writer is even more astounding. Eliezer's dying words are reported to be as follows. Thou, O God, knowest that though I might save myself, I am dying by fiery torments for thy law. Be merciful unto thy people, and let our punishment be a satisfaction in their behalf. Make my blood their purification, and take my soul to ransom their souls. That's from the fourth book of Maccabees. When considering the topic of a sacrifice for forgiveness of sin, these words are both powerful and inspirational. But to suggest that Eliezer's death could be salvific in any capacity misses a fundamental concept of sacrifice as understood within biblical Judaism or Christianity. To be accepted as a sacrifice, any animal presented to the priests as a victim to be offered was required to be sacrificially perfect, unblemished. That criteria was non-negotiable. No standard less than an unblemished sacrifice was to be offered to our holy God. There's no suggestion in any writings that Eliezer met that biblical requirement. He was a man. In all likelihood, he was a good man when compared to many men. But nonetheless, he was an imperfect, sin-blemished human being. Therefore, he was disqualified by sin from being an acceptable atonement for other sinners. The literature describing this event is both fascinating and relevant, though not canonical and not normally included in either the Jewish or Protestant Christian Bibles of today. The Apocrypha is valued by Jews as a crucial source of data to understand our history and to study the origins of our Jewish celebrations of Chanukah. By the way, in prior centuries, the Apocrypha was included as a section of most King James Bibles, and it continues to be part of the Catholic Bible. And now I want us to consider some rabbinic traditions, both old and new. I mean, original Judaism. The, the Jewish people of antiquity had a very different view of atonement. Modern Jewish practices ignore the core requirements of God's commands to secure atonement. In this regard, rabbinic Judaism fails to mirror the faith of our forefathers. Perhaps that is why the High Holy Days are altered to the point of being unrecognizable when compared to ancient practices. This comment is not intended to downplay the beauty of modern Judaism. Rather, it questions its adequacy. Who gave the rabbis of the early Christian era the right to determine God's standard on sin, sacrifice, or atonement? History reveals they took this authority for themselves. Both Judaism and Christianity are guilty of exalting their own beloved traditions over biblical mandates, but the rabbis have redefined their authority to such a degree that their ability to responsibly interpret the will of God must be questioned. For example, 
you know, the claims of the ultra-Orthodox rabbis to maintain an unbroken stream of revelation and authority from Moses through the oral law, the Talmud, it's a flawed theory. It's no more credible than the claims of the Pope's infallibility or his own broken connection to Peter. Just as Protestant Christians rejected papal authority throughout rabbinic history, thinking Jews of many flavors have doubted the claims of the rabbis. Opposing views in the past were prevalent. Millions of Karite Jews rejected the final authority of the oral law in antiquity. They believed the, the written Torah was sufficient, and they did not trust their opponents to reinterpret the written law with the new oral law. Opposing views in our time continue to exist in enormous numbers. Consider one Jewish historian and thinker who wrote, through the power of interpretation, the Jews were able to free themselves from laws of the Torah, which they found difficult, unethical, harsh, or unreasonable, but they would rarely admit that they were overturning the sacred text. They would insist that they were merely interpreting it. So you have rabbis of the early Christian era who sought and found a way to do exactly what the previous Jewish authors suggested through interpretation. They freed themselves from laws of the Torah which they found difficult. When questioned, many modern Jews reject the oral law. They realize it does not belong in the canon of Scripture. It's wrong to reinvent the Bible through the opinions of one group of rabbis over another group of rabbis. God's decisions were never intended to be determined by popular vote or, I don't know, according to the favorite rabbinic flavor du jour. This is especially unwise given that many of the rabbis who created the oral law came from a limited stream of Judaism that in many ways clashed with and contradicted other streams of Jewish thought. It's theologically dangerous to have empowered rabbis from numerous generations to own the